Um, I'm going to talk specifically about um, planetary uh, astronomy. I'm going to concentrate on one planet and one recent uh, set of events. So what we're looking at here is a Hubble Space Telescope picture that was taken um, in the spring of 2006. That's Jupiter's great red spot. Um, we've gone from the small to the large scale now in our talks. This is 26,000 kilometers across. Um, the Reynolds number is about 10 to the 12th. Um, this is at 34 degrees south latitude. That's 23 degrees south latitude. This is a new red spot in 350 years of observation since Hook reported it in volume one, number one of the Royal Astronomical Society Journal. Um, it's only had one red spot. This appeared in late 2005, and I want to talk a little bit about its story. Um, so um, I've been interested in, in, the, uh, in climate change on Jupiter. Jupiter um, has a very uh, dynamic atmosphere. This is a picture that was taken uh, in 1998. Um, it's a planet uh, that has well-defined zonal structures, a set of east-west winds, and a bunch of vortices on top of it. Um, in uh, 2007, uh, a lot of activity was happening on the planet. It just did not look like the same planet. It was in a state of upheaval. The red spot is on the other side of the planet, so it's still there, but you can't see it. Here's a stagnation point over here with a big intrusion of red material um, going into the southern uh, white material. Here's this new little red spot that was formed. And the question is, what's going on here? Why has this planet changed? Um, starting in about 2001, um, based on computational fluid dynamics, which you can apply to the atmosphere of Jupiter because it obeys the Navier-Stokes equation in a very turbulent regime, um, we started publishing papers based on the results of our calculations that claim that Jupiter would have a significant climate change um, first starting in about 2006 um, due to uh, basically temperature changes in some latitudes of 10 degrees or more. Um, so uh, when we started talking about a change, you've got to say a change from what? Um, Jupiter's atmosphere is dominated by jet streams. It's got 12 of them. We have one in the northern hemisphere, basically, and one in the southern hemisphere. We're jet stream poor. There are 12 eastward going jet streams and 12 westward going jet streams on the planet. They have characteristic velocities of 50 to 100 meters per second. Superposed on top of those are long lived vortices. Something like 100 of them were cataloged by the Voyager flyby in 1979. The most famous of them is the red spot. And then, um, in, uh, slightly south of them, there were these three white oval storms that were about 15,000 kilometers apiece. Um, if you look at Jupiter and look at the catalog storms, um, uh, they can either rotate clockwise or counterclockwise. Those that rotate in the same direction as the planet are known as cyclones, and those that op rotate in the opposite direction are anticyclones. In the southern hemisphere, which I'll be talking about mostly today, an anticyclone is counterclockwise. 90% of the cataloged uh, and labeled vortices that were supposed to be long-lived on Jupiter were 90%. Um, so what you have is basically star, uh, stripes and spots on the planet, the jet streams and the vortices. And on, sitting on top of that is uh, turbulence of an order of about two meters per second. OK, so um, we don't have the luxury of going and making measurements on the planet. What we get is to look at the clouds, which may or may not reflect what's going on in the dynamics. Um, and we get a one two-dimensional slice of a complicated three-dimensional motion. After that, it's uh, up to us using our tuition, our tools, and our computational fluid dynamics to figure out what's going on in the planet and to try and explain what we see and try and make predictions about the future of it. So for example, when you see clouds, like these red clouds of the red spot, um, is that always indicative of a long-lived vortex? Um, can you figure out from the morphology of the clouds whether a vortex is going around in a clockwise or, or counterclockwise direction? Um, are there vortices sitting around that don't have clouds that you know, tell you where to look? Um, so, so we really have our, our work cut out to try and figure out what's happening on this planet. So a little bit of a background. Um, this is a mosaic that was put together from uh, the 1979 uh, Voyager uh, trip to uh, Jupiter. Um, and what people had done here is um, they, 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 they found that there's this zone of velocity, this east-west wind, these jet streams given by this sort of magenta line here. And the way you got that line, the way people did it, was they took a line of pixels on the planet and they saw that after 10 hours, one rotation period of the planet, that it shifted to the left 
or to the right, and they look for correlations, and that's how they inferred these velocities. Um, you can do the same thing for the vortices. Um, people actually treated the clouds like passive particles, and when they did so, they were to able to, after, you know, you see, oh, here's a cloud, mm, I think I see that same little piece of cloud 10 hours later, and you put a little line there, you divide by the time, and that gives you a velocity. And so people had extracted from, uh, for the red spot of Jupiter for the first time, you can see it was really going around in a counterclockwise direction, it was truly an anticyclone. This seems like a lot of velocity vectors to extract. Um, people in fluid dynamics for the last 20 years have been using particle image velocimetry and coherent image velocimetry to get much more accurate, much more dense set of vectors. Um, so one thing I'm not going to have time to talk about but we'll refer to in a bit is that one of the things that we did over the last year and a half is by using um, data acquisition and CFD, we were able to finally make particle image velocimetry work for planets. And so instead of having to deal with 1,500 vectors here, we can now extract half a million vectors and get much more accuracy. And we can do that using the Hubble Space Telescope, which is in low Earth orbit, um, rather than have to actually go to Jupiter and do a flyby. Okay, so one of the things that you should know about Jupiter is that um, all these 90% of the vortices that are anticyclones, they don't just appear randomly on the planet. Um, they, except for the red spot, occur in groups. And what they do is they occur in specifically in rows, that is rows at a constant latitude. And each latitude corresponds to a peak of the westward jet slightly on the polar side. So some examples of that are, here's a red spot, um, 34 degrees, here is a white oval. Um, there were three of them around the planet. You can only see one of them in this picture, so I'll take my word for it, they're in a row at 34 degrees. Um, here is identified an anticyclone, an anticyclone, an anticyclone. There were 12 of them around the planet at 41 degrees. And um, here is a mosaic put together that's rolled out. Um, here you see some of those at 41 degrees. They don't all show up in this wavelength. At the northern latitudes, you see a row here of anticyclone, 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 and so on. Different wavelengths reveal different clouds. Um, okay, so these guys come in rows. So I did a lot of numerical simulations of the great red spot um, back in the early uh, 90s, and I wanted to do then a row of vortices, and I was incapable of doing it. I wanted to do a row of anticyclones, and so using some numerical methods, I could not produce a row of vortices, and the reason has a very simple mathematical explanation. Uh, this is latitude, this is velocity, this is a uh, westward going jet stream, so the velocity is going to be east here, east here, west there. Vortices only hang out and thrive and are robust, and it's if their sense of rotation has the same sign as the shear that they're in. Otherwise, there'd be stagnation points and they'd be ripped apart. So you could have a row of vortices here at what, the same latitude if they all had the same strength and they'd be in equilibrium because basically vortices produce a velocity field from the of savar law. You can figure out what that velocity field is. So each little anticyclone here produces a, its own little counterclockwise velocity. So this would be uh, a stable, uh, an, uh, an equilibrium vortex because this vortex here is trying to push him down. This vortex here is trying to push him up. And so they're in equilibrium, but it's not a very stable equilibrium. If I lifted this guy just up a little bit, he'd come under the influence of this uh, uh, the shear that he's in, and he'd be dragged to the west or to the left here. And when two vortices of like sign get close to each other, typically within a diameter, they very quickly, on a few turnaround times, merge together. So all of my vortices were hopelessly unstable when I put them in a line. Um, in fact, you can reduce this to a first-year graduate uh, problem to solve. You can replace these by point vortices. You can do a problem like in Lamb's book, and you can see that this is an unstable layer. All right, so, so the only way that I was able to, by playing with the computer models, to make a stable row of anticyclones was to uh, go against conventional wisdom and said, hmm, maybe they're cyclones as well. So here is a, a region of anticyclonic shear, so I've got vortices in a row going this way. Here is a region of cyclonic shear, so I've got cyclonic vortices. If I stagger them like a Carmen vortex street, this is a very stable configuration. Because if this guy were to be kicked and moved upward to the north, he would start to move to the left because he'd be beckoned by this west, westward jet stream. But before he could merge with this anticyclone over here, he'd encounter the velocity field of this guy 
He's going around in a clockwise direction. He pushes him down. He comes under the influence of this eastward jet and gets pushed back. And he'll then come under the influence of this vortex. He'll go back and forth. That's what the numerical simulations show. Again, if you take a first year gradual problem and do a double row of point vortices, you say it's, you find, find it's neutrally stable and you can calculate the frequencies of the oscillations. So the only way I was able to use numerical methods uh, produce a row of stable anticyclones was to assume that there were long-lived cyclones that we couldn't see because for some reason the clouds wouldn't show that. Um, this would also explain why there's only one great red spot on Jupiter. If um, you're, here is a, a red spot and there was another red spot at the same latitude, 23 degrees, the equator would be up here somewhere to prevent these two guys from merging and I'd have to have a cyclone in between, but the cyclone would be very close to the equator. Jupiter has very stable vortices because it's a rapidly rotating planet. Rapid rotation tends to make a more two-dimensional atmosphere. In two-dimensional turbulence, information and vorticity go from small scales to large scales. In three-dimensional fluid, it's the opposite way. Vortices typically in turbulent medium do not last more than one or two turnaround times before they fall apart. If I want to be up here at 15 degrees, the Coriolis force is big at the North Pole. It's big, but with the opposite sign at the South Pole. At the equator, it's zero. If you look at the movies that were taken by the, the satellites, um, the uh, atmosphere near 15 degrees, plus or minus on either side of the equator, does not look like the rest of the planet. It's obviously 3D. You see upwelling motions. You see downwelling motions. It's a bad place for cyclones to survive. It's a bad place for anti -vor any vortex to survive because it's filled with 3D turbulence. So assuming there's no vortices up here, then they, if I built two red spots, they would immediately merge to together. So that would be explained why you'd only have one vortex, one large vortex near the equator. Of course, um, so the argument was that these invisible cyclones prevent things from, uh, from, from getting close to each other. They're going to repel them. Of course, just after that paper was published, Jupiter played a nasty trick on me. Um, this is a Galileo photograph. Um, here's a red spot. There are three white uh, ovals at 34 degrees south latitude at this time this was taken. Um, and these two guys, these two anticyclones, um, are very, very close together. Um, this was unidentified initially by uh, the NASA astronomers. Um, and these guys traveled around the planet as a unit for a couple of years. Um, so they should have repelled, but they didn't. Um, so one reason you can explain that is, again, go back to computational fluid dynamics. You just don't have a bunch of vortices on the planet. They are interacting with the jet streams that are nearby, the east and westward ones. You see that on Earth all the time. Here's our one eastward going jet stream uh, across the United States. Um, here is a cyclone. So this, this, sorry, this, this cyclone in the, uh, in the northern hemisphere is counterclockwise. So there's no stagnation point between the cyclone and the jet stream. What happens is that you get a cyclone jet stream interaction. The, the, you produce waves from the cyclone on the jet stream. You get a trough. You get a Rossby wave, basically, that produces a trough. The cyclone gets trapped in the trough, and it's a very stable configuration. Well, um, what we showed um, here, just schematically, is that you can have multiple vortices uh, trapped in the trough of a jet stream. So imagine this jet stream is going from uh, to the eastward direction. Um, there's an anti-cyclone here. I mean, now I'm back in the southern hemisphere. Um, and, and this thing uh, is uh, trapped. And the reason it's trapped is because when you have a jet stream, you have a jump in the vorticity, typically, um, on, on, on Jupiter. And so what happens is that there's a jump that you're much more cyclonic in terms of your vorticity on, on south of the jet stream than you are in the north. So these little humps over here that form the trough basically look like virtual cyclones. And so it's these cyclones that are doing the repelling of the anticyclone to keep it there. But you can have more than one vortex get trapped into a trough. And so you can have, uh, say, an anticyclone, an anticyclone, a cyclone. And here are two virtual cyclones. And that is also a stable configuration. It turns out if you have a freely moving bunch of Kármán vortex streets, there's a critical value if I were to decrease the value of the cyclone. If I go, low, go below that value, I can trap a, a, a ser several of those vortices in that game. If I were to re-boost this up in its value of circulation, it would repel these guys and push everybody to break free from your trapped configuration. So we calculated those numbers. There's hysteresis. They're not the same. But you can have multiple vortices trapped. So to sort of, and I apologize for this numerical simulation. It's old. Um, and it's actually part of a much bigger simulation of the planet, so you're not going to see much in the resolution of the, uh, 
here. I'm going to blow it up, at least in the east-west direction. What you're seeing here is um, a color represents the potential vorticity. The potential vorticity is like the vorticity. The vorticity is just the curl of the velocity in normal everyday two-dimensional fluid dynamics. Um, the vorticity goes with the flow. If you're in a rotating atmosphere and you've got a three dimensions to it, then you have a modification of the vorticity. There is a, a, a it comes to a quantity called the potential vorticity, which is made of the vorticity plus some other terms, and that quantity just goes with the flow. So the pixels here just go with the flow. They're the potential vorticity. And what you have here is two anticyclones and a cyclone in between. So the color represents the cyclonicity of it. Uh, and what happens here in this little piece of calculation is this guy's really trapped between this guy and this guy. You know, he comes close to him. He's repelled. He comes close to this guy. It's periodic. He'll come on the other side. And so this illustrates the, the trapping and repulsive mechanism. If there were another little blue cyclone over here, he would eventually hit that blue cyclone and reverse direction and go back and hit this guy. So um, that just illustrates the repelling mechanism. Um, here, the same calculation is going to show um, that this the color still represents potential vorticity, but here at our jet stream, we actually have a, a realistic jet stream where there's a jump in the potential vorticity across that jet stream. We're bluer, more cyclonic on the southern part of it. So this is much more what, like the, the kind of configuration that you'd see on Jupiter. And these shoulders over here can find this guy and this guy from going away. And the two red-orange guys can find the blue guy from going away. And they'll just bounce around like that, basically ad nauseum, or until you run out of computer funding. Um, so this is a stable configuration. It's not that stable. Um, if I weren't trapped at the bottom of, by this Rossby wave, if they were just free, it would take a huge amount of perturbation, like about a velocity perturbation, about 40 meters per second, to, to make this blue guy and this red guy shift positions. That would be a huge perturbation. So the two red guys were next to each other and then could merge. Okay, when they're confined like this, I'm putting the squeeze on everybody. It only requires about a three... Um, meter per second perturbation to make these guys uh, shift positions and move. So um, this is the explanation of why we thought that the two of those white ovals were wandering around together, not separating for years. This is a picture uh, of a frame of that simulation I just showed you. This is a picture that appeared in the New York Times above the fold of a nice Galileo photograph of uh, two white ovals here that were traveling together. This was actually misidentified in the New York Times as an anticyclone because at that time people still really believed there were no long-lived stable cyclones on Jupiter, so this had to be an anticyclone. I think there's some similarity qualitatively between this picture and this phenomena that you see over here. Okay, so, um, so Jupiter has this very funny tendency that it goes behind the sun. We can't see it um, for much of the year. So it's just emerging from behind the sun right now. Um, interesting things happen on Jupiter when it's behind the sun. So in September of 97, there were these three white ovals at 34 degrees latitude. There's an object there which I believe was a cyclone. Um, in July, when we looked at it again with the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, three guys had become two. Um, here it is in October 99, we've got two guys in this mysterious thing which I think is a cyclone in between, and we looked at it again in September after it came out behind the sun, there was only one. Something happened, what I think happened to those guys was they merged together. So here are our three vortices all trapped happy together in the Rossby wave trough over here. Um, so what happens if you put a little perturbation on the system? So here is our jet stream that represents a change in potential vorticity. These guys are trapped inside, he's trapped. This little untrapped guy comes in, it's gonna get repelled, but gets just enough perturbation to bam, he's gone and these guys merge together. Uh, it was probably not another cyclone that perturbed the system, it's probably when the, the three vortices went close to the great red spot. So what we think happened, why the vortices merged together, was we thought that, based on these kinds of computations, that there were mergers going on. Okay, so let me say a few words. Um, you know, when one does experiments, if you can't see the parts of an atom back in the 30s, you fire things at the nucleus of an atom to say, oh yes, there are neutrons there. We couldn't measure them in any other way. Okay, so here's my case for cyclones. I don't think um, we, people don't identify cyclones on the planet. 
but, but dynamically, I'm desperate for them because no other numerical simulations will allow vortices to survive at the same latitude for years and years and years, can explain this bunching up of, of vortices to travel around, or, or the merger things. Um, they're not disallowed by any set of three-dimensional equations or two-dimensional equations. It's just that people have not seen them directly on the planet for the most part. Um, and one of the arguments is people have seen cyclonic regions of clouds, but the clouds look very disorganized and filamentary. And people, the arguments that appeared in the literature is that, oh, these can't be the streamlines of long-lived coherent cyclones because no self-respecting vortex would have such a tangled set of streamlines. But I need to remind you from undergraduate fluid dynamics that streamlines are not the same as particle paths when you have a time-dependent fluid. Okay, so there's no reason to believe that the cloud morphology represents the streamlines. It represents something else that's happening. So in a calculation that's going to go through very briefly because um, we don't have much time, um, when, when one has one of this region of anticyclonic um, potential vorticity like a red spot, if I actually look at the curl of the velocity and find out what the true vorticity is, if I have an anticyclone, only the core of it really is anticyclonic, and the, and the envelope around it is cyclonic. In fact, you can show that the circulation at long distance for an isolated spot of potential vorticity, the circulation has to go to zero. So that means if I integrate over all the blue and all the red, it has to be equal to zero here. So a true vortex, uh, like the red spot, um, will have an anticyclonic true, the vorticity be anticyclonic on the inside, and the opposite on the outside. There's three-dimensional motions. These are kind of two and a half dimensional calculations I'm going to talk about right now. Towards the end, we'll talk about real 3D simulations. In regions that are truly the curl of velocity is anticyclonic, you have upwelling motion. And in the other region where it's cyclonic, you have downwelling motion. Well, what you look at when you're looking at the clouds of Jupiter, for the most part, is ammonia ice crystals. And when you bring fluid up in a subadiabatic stable atmosphere, you cool that parcel of fluid, you're going to make ice. If you've got downwelling with science, you're going to take the ice and make it go away. So not only do you have particles traveling along um, uh, chaotic uh, uh, paths in this particle but the problem that aren't the same as the streamlines, you've got where you have your particles that you're looking at that you're treating as passive particles, you're creating them and destroying them preferentially differently for a cyclone than you are for an anticyclone. So we did the obvious thing. We did a numerical simulation, and we actually put particles in there. And we said, OK, we have upwelling regions. You're going to become a nice white pixel. And we've got downwelling regions. You're going to have a black pixel. This was a calculation that was done where we treated the cyclones and anticyclones for Carmen Vortex Street absolutely identically. So the velocities are mirror images. So here is a, quote, anticyclone where, where the red region is, I'm creating white pixels. Where it's blue, I'm destroying them. Here, which is a cyclone, I'm creating them in the blue region, uh, red region, I'm destroying them in the blue. And yet you get very different uh, morphologies of the clouds. This is a picture that was taken by Voyager in 1979 at 41 degrees south latitude. It shows what was identified as an anticyclone and an anticyclone and two cyclonic patches that were not vortices. Okay? So what you see here is uh, a region that's nice, bright, and elliptical, presumably where you've got upwelling and you're creating ice. And you've got a death region for ice around it where you've got subsidence and you're melting it. Okay? Here you've got filament regions. Here's a numerical simulation. This represents the black and white. Here represents the potential vorticity. They're exactly degenerate. The curl, the velocity produced by this is shown in this. So here where it's white, I create my clouds. Here where it's black, I destroy them. And after you let this movie run for a little bit while, what you see are traces that are bright white and elliptical that mark very well where the anticyclones are and a bunch of filamentary twisted line where the cyclones were. So you, you can't do everything with observations because we can't actually go and sample the atmosphere under general conditions. So we have to use numerical simulations and computational fluid dynamics to infer what's going on. OK. Um, so now let me get to the next piece of why we predicted the climate was going to change. Um, there's something very interesting. Um, I, I keep referring to Voyager. There have been three other expeditions, uh, satellite expeditions to Jupiter since then. But it turns out that Voyager had the best equipment on it. Um, the uh, Galileo mission had some really, really great stuff, but the antenna never unfolded, so we don't get much data back. Didn't get much data back from it. So in 1979, Voyager 
have the capability of actually measuring the temperature at the cloud top level. To do that, you need have to have enough instruments to, stamp, to sample enough of the visible and infrared part of the spectrum to get a bolometric understanding of what the temperature is. Um, what was really interesting and surprising is that they found that the temperature at the equator was basically the same as the temperature at the poles within four degrees, which is unusual because you'd expect, for the same reasons you get on Earth, the temperature at the equator to be warmer than the temperature at the poles, right? You're getting more direct sunlight there. So um, there was a problem. People needed to understand why is the, is the equator um, uh, just as cool as the poles or vice versa. Um, one people argument people said, well, well, we know that below the clouds there's a convective zone. And that convective zone is very good at meridionally, that is north-south transport of heat. But if you actually do the simulations, you find that most of the sunlight is absorbed in a cloud layer above that. And, and that's not going to make the poles and the equator uh, uniform. In fact, if you place the top of the convective zone with a pure conductor, you're still going to get a 20 to 25 degree difference between the equators and the poles. If you want to have the temperatures the same at the equators and poles, you've got to have good mixing in the cloud layer itself. So this goes back to numerical simulations. Here are three vortices, right, 34 degrees south latitude. Um, and they're producing velocities that have north-south components. So we did a calculation. Let's heat things up from the sun. And let's see, do you get the equator and pole to be the same temperature due to the vortices, which hang out basically at all of the jet streams? So the, all the jet streams between the equator, say, and the South Pole have rows of vortices, so they all have some of this north-south velocity. Uh, did the calculation, and no. It still left you with a very strong temperature difference between the equator and the pole. That was using a calculation of the velocity field that we had done statically, right? Boom. Now, if we put in dynamics and repeat the numerical calculation, these three vortices with their unseen cyclones, or maybe that's a seen cyclone, are not just sitting there. They're oscillating back and forth, oscillating back and forth. Now, uh, we know that chaos is really good at mixing. Laminar flows are not very good at mixing. So if I take a bucket of red paint and a bucket of white paint, and I want to make pink paint, and so I slowly and laminarly stir, I don't get pink paint. I get red paint interweaved with white paint. If I want to make pink paint, a little bit of chaos goes a long way. Well, when you have three vortices, you can show that the motion is going to be chaotic. So you do the same calculation with the heat transfer, and you allow the fluid to have real, real motion chaos to it, and you can make the poles and the equator have the same temperature. That's good news, but when these guys merged from three vortices to two in 1996 and 1998, and then merged again and formed just one vortex between 1998 and 2000, you only had one vortex, there's no chaos anymore. And therefore, if this was the right mechanism for shuttling heat between the equator and the poles, you were going to suddenly have a barrier heat transport at 34 degrees south latitude. The thermal time scale of the atmosphere at the elevation of these vortices is about four years. So the prediction would be that sometime around 19, uh, 2005, 2006, you'd start seeing the effects in the atmosphere of the shutdown of the heat transport. OK, so we, we published this. It didn't make it to nature until 2004, but that was enough time. Um, there are no thermometers on Jupiter. We do not have the capability of any uh, ground-based telescope or any satellite to measure the temperatures the way that, um, that Voyager did. So you have to infer the temperature differences. So, um, so when the white oval that formed from all of these mergers, from the pair of mergers, occurred in 2000 um, uh, and, and then turned red uh, five years later, um, we wanted to know, is this, a is this a sign of temperature change on the planet? So um, I need to tell you very briefly a couple things. Um, I need to tell you that um, the quality of data that you get back from the Hubble Space Telescope is pretty crude compared with what when you have a flyby like Voyager. OK, so what I'm not going to tell you is you can go into any kind of NASA website, and you'll see lots of pictures of vortices going around. Um, that, and each frame at the NASA website will represent one frame that was clicked by a camera, typically um, once every 10 hours, which is the rotation period of the planet. Um, this is not that. Only the first and last frames of this 
were, um, were, were, were gotten from an actual image. The rest are the computer simulations of the velocity that we derived from uh, those images to try and, and figure out what the velocity, to infer the velocity by, by coming up with a method of, of a particle image velocimetry that it would actually reproduce the flow. So I'm not, again, I'm not going to go in, into how we did that. But basically, Voyager had a uh, uncertainty of the velocities of about eight meters per second. Um, what we can now do with Hubble Space Telescope is get three meters per second uncertainties in the velocity. So we can go back to the Voyager and Cassini uh, 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 trips and, and actually reproduce, get, extract from those very uh, good velocities. So um, the question is, is, it turned red in December of 2005. It was white in, when it formed in 2000. Is this a sign of temperature change? And um, maybe um, the first thing we wanted to do was, um, was there something different about the velocity between 2000 and 2000, December of 2005? So in 2006 in April, we got the Hubble Space Telescope and um, we, uh, we took these velocity measurements it's through the east-west axis and we found basically that there was no difference. The velocities had not changed. Um, so let me just say very quickly, um, uh, basically, if you want to have a vortex in 3D, we did three-dimensional simulations, the center, the interior of the vortex is got a high pressure because it's in what's called quasi-geostrophic balance between the Coriolis force on the planet and the pressure forces. In the horizontal, that's the thing. In the vertical direction, to keep this high pressure confined, you've got to have a cold, dense lid at the top and a buoyant, warm lid at the bottom. Um, and they are in equilibrium. But the thermal... Uh, uh, the, this cold lid at the top is going to go away after a certain amount of time, four years, which is the radio time scale. And so what happens then, you're not in pressure equilibrium, so you get a velocity to come up, but the velocity, it's okay, you're in a stable environment, so a rising velocity produces cooling, and that brings back, back to, to equilibrium. So you actually can calculate the velocity both numerically and back to the envelope calculation afterwards, and find that, yes, that velocity is giving you the entropy flux that's lost by the thermal time scale of the atmosphere. So our picture is the following, um, uh, uh, is that we have a cloud layer where we're looking, and you're getting upwelling along the core and a downwelling in the bottom half. It spreads out, um, and then it sinks back down so that you've got uh, a, 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 a basically a secondary circulation flow. Cool, rising cools things, warming, you get warming when you have a descending flow in a stable atmosphere. So we argued that there was a warm ring at the top of the vortex. Um, so the question is, not only what caused the, the, the red color to form, why did it take six years after the formation, and why is it after four and a half years still confined to the ring? Because I can calculate numerically how long you get mixing inside the vortex to these motions, um, the, the internal mixing time inside this is in the order of a month. So if I can find red particles, red basketballs, red footballs, red soccer balls to a ring, the whole darn plant, the whole darn vortex should have been completely red within a few months. Um, and the answer to this, I think, is the following. It's due to Bob West, who, argued, who noticed that uh, Jupiter was slightly redder in the summer months and slightly whiter in the cool months. We don't know what gives the red of the red spot or the new red spot its color, but we do know it's a solid because it doesn't have a well-defined spectral line. So his argument, Bob West's argument, was that you've got red particulates. Clouds tend to form when you have nuclei. The, what's gonna, you're going to form a cloud of the ammonia gas in the atmosphere. It's going to suddenly become a solid, and it will be white. So his argument was that you're, you're at this very critical layer in the atmosphere, right where the critical sublimation temperature and pressure are. When you go to the summertime, when you go in the wintertime, you take these red particles and you sublimate or mantle white ice onto it so you get a slight color change. In the summer months, you go back and you melt that. So if you apply that same argument here, what we saw, what we think was that there was this global temperature change warming up on Jupiter. Before the warm, the, 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 the clouds up here were all sufficiently cool that they were mantled with ice all year round. Right? But now, this whole thing is warmed up. If you're the warmest part, it's going to be this warm ring. And so here, you've melted the ice, and you're seeing the bare red nuclei. So the nuclei can be running back and forth and mixing like crazy. But here, it's going to be warm because you've got a descending ring. Here, it's going to be cool because you've got the cool core. So you're going to be red here and white there. So that is our explanation of why it took one thermal time scale to get the color change and why you can have freely moving particulates but still have red in the core. So the conclusions I want are that we use CFD to test the model, to build the model, compare with observations, and make predictions of a change. 
Um, the dimensions of the vortex, of the new red oval, its velocities and relative thermal properties were unchanged from when it was white. Um, dredging or putting particles of some other form into that red particles in does not explain the color change because it cannot explain why you're confined to a ring. Only a global temperature change, as far as I know, is the only theory that can explain why you have a red ring. We've also run some more calculations and we um, com compared some more Hubble Space Telescope observations in November before um, Jupiter went behind the sun and we have some more predictions to make. So um, uh, uh, it's the first time in public I made the prediction. I believe our calculations certainly show that Within the next year, you're going to start populating, you're going to probably put another vortex back into the, to the latitude of 34 degrees. And the reason being is because of these temperature changes, you've made the jet stream um, just north of this red oval unstable to baroclinic instability. So we're getting breaking waves in it now, and it's producing vortices. And you're going to get a vortex pair of a cyclone and anticyclone, and so you're not going to be able to merge those guys together. The cyclone will protect the two anticyclones from merging. So um, if that's true, even your backyard neighbor you know, looking through his telescope will be able to see that. So, so I'm predicting in the next year or 18 months, you're going to, you're going to see another vortex pop out at 34 degrees south latitude based on computational fluid dynamics. And thank you very much.